I brought a couple of friends along here. Um, and uh, thank you to Glenn for introducing Emerson. And this is, this is Walt. Um, the original title for this talk was A New World Naked, Gebzer Jung Hillman and the American Mythos. Um, because of time constraints, I will, will uh, not get to uh, Hillman and Gebzer all that much, although I hope to say a few words about, about them. And um, instead of A New World Naked, the title has been modified, and you'll hear that in at the very end of the talk. So let me just uh, plunge in. <clears throat> I'd like today to explore the American mythos, the vision implicit in historic versions of such, and the revisioning of that mythos called for, or should I rather say, calling for and to us today. One feature of that mythos inheres in its emphasis on the local, the knowledge that a whole universe is always present in the here and now. Think of Walden, Pond, and Thoreau. Another is its poetical character. And so in tune with my subject, I begin by offering a poem of this place, one that I myself wrote during a recent stay at Asilomar. Night Walk. On the beach at Asilomar, the ocean rolling black and boundless, the tongues of waves glimmering, sibilant, washing my feet on the shore. Star crystals spill across the sky, silver windows open to infinity. Above and below, father and mother in eternal embrace, speaking darkly to one another, and I, their child, strolling the shore, listening to the endless love whisper, hearing and chanting songs. This poem is inspired by the work of one of the principal shapers of the American mythos. Walt Whitman is so identified with the idea of America that one cannot separate his poetic genius from that idea. Let me then initiate a listing of nine major features of the mythos by reciting the opening lines of Whitman's signature poem. I celebrate myself and sing myself, and what I assume you shall assume, for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. This is the opening salvo of Whitman's Song of Myself, and the very title of the work names, with exemplary simplicity, the first and perhaps most fundamental feature of the mythos, a championing of the self, the individual, and the rights and liberties that constitute its inalienable prerogatives. The value originally emerged against the background of the privilege historically accorded to not the individual citizen, but the king, whose person functioned as the center of sovereignty in a monarchy, the model of governance that had dominated the old European world. Thoreau provides a succinct formulation of the American ideal of the sovereign individual as such emerged in the nation's struggle for political independence. The progress from an absolute to a limited monarchy, from a limited monarchy to a democracy, is a progress toward a true respect for the individual. There will never be a free and enlightened state until the state comes to recognize the individual as a higher and independent power from which all its own power and authority are derived. Both Thoreau and Whitman were inspired by Ralph Waldo Emerson, another chief spokesman of the American mythos and author of the famous essay that lent paradigmatic expression to this same theme, one named by ex-President Obama as one of his favorite reads, namely, Self-Reliance. Two, originality, the new world. 
The second point's related to the first and likewise tied to America's political history, just as the idea of the sovereignty of the individual self represents a departure from the tradition of monarchy, American independence, by definition, represents a revolutionary break from the past, from European history, and from all history. The break from the old world gives rise to the idea of a fresh beginning to the myth of the new world. Just as America's celebration of the self is granted iconic expression at Whitman's poem, the principle of originality finds signature expression in the opening of this country's book of revelations, Emerson's Nature. Our age is retrospective. It builds the sepulchres of the fathers. It writes biographies, histories, criticism. The foregoing generation beheld God and nature face to face, we through their eyes. Why should not we also enjoy an original relation to the universe? Why should not we have a poetry and philosophy of insight and not tradition, and a religion by revelation to us? and not the history of theirs. Modern poets have rehearsed Emerson's theme with powerful precision. Ezra Pound exhorted American writers to make it new. His friend William Carlos Williams championed an American idiom that, in marked contrast to expatriate T.S. Eliot's commitment to tradition, might achieve a decisive break from the past, inaugurating a new world naked. Well before these moderns, though, Whitman expressed the gist of the idea as it cooperates with and indeed flows from the supremacy of the individual self, giving rise to the privilege of the present, the eternal now, that, like the Gebvarian A. Cronon, or ever-present origin, reveals agent power not bound to or by historical time. And this is Whitman. You shall no longer take things at second or third hand, nor look through the eyes of the dead, nor feed on the specters in books. You shall not look through my eyes either, nor take things from me. You shall listen to all sides and filter them from yourself. There was never any more inception than there is now, nor any more youth or age than there is now, and will never be any more perfection than there is now, nor any more heaven and hell than there is now. Three, nature. This feature refers us back to the title of Emerson's epochal book, if the individual self stands free, it owes its power and prerogative not to a personal ego alienated from the world, but to a self open to and receptive of the superabundant force indwelling the cosmos. As the continuation of Emerson's seminal text makes clear, it's this relation to nature that christens individual experience as a chief vehicle of authentic knowledge and so authorizes the heralded break from the past. Embosomed for a season in nature whose floods of life stream around and through us and invite us by the powers they supply to action proportioned to nature, why should we grope among the dry bones of the past or put the living generation into masquerade out of its faded wardrobe? The sun shines today also. Legions of writers, including Thoreau, Muir, Jeffers, Abby, Snyder, Barry, Oliver, and the list goes on and on, bear witness to the central role played by nature in the American imagination, its place as a cornerstone of the American mythos. Four, <clears throat> illimitability. From the first, the very idea of the new world was inseparable from the vast natural expanse of the continent, the countless miles of virgin forests, 
the endless plains, the grand mountains, the sense of illimitability, of infinite opportunity for expansion, the exceeding, thank you, Sean, the exceeding of all possible boundary marked the American mentality from the first, finding legendary expression in the frontier and eschatological echo in ideas of manifest destiny. In America, imaginatively speaking, the sky is not the limit. It's the portal to a new heaven and a new earth. Whitman again. Have you reckoned a thousand acres much? Have you reckoned the earth much? Stop this day and night with me, and you shall possess the good of the earth and the sun. There are thousands of suns left. Five, <clears throat> creativity and poetic character. Infinite possibility means to unbounded potential to make of things what you will. The cosmic magnitude of being gives rise to illimitable fabricative or creative power. Strictly speaking, the new world is not so much found as it is made, as pound recognized. The creative act, moreover, is intrinsically a poetic one. The root form of poetry is the Greek word poein, to make, but poein or poesis is different from techne, which also is a kind of making. Poesis means to make or produce after a fashion that is primarily imaginative and contemplative, the end of which is no practical goal but vision itself, the contemplation of truth or beauty. So is Emerson's most representative man or woman, the poet, as declared in the essay so titled. So does Walt Whitman write in his preface, the Americans of all nations at any time, of all nations at any time upon the earth have probably the fullest poetical nature. The United States themselves are essentially the greatest poem. Six, idealism. Correlative to both the illimitable, the cosmic dimension of the American self, and its creative agency is its fundamentally spiritual character. The idealism that, from the first, infuses the American mythos. Politically speaking, the nations founded not upon the continuation of any royal bloodline or indeed human governance of any sort, but upon ideas, principles of liberty, equality, the just rule of law, and the like. That such high ideals were egregiously betrayed before, during, and after their formulation doesn't belie the truth that they continue to comprise the spiritual foundation of the nation. The fact that we're currently in a struggle to maintain the viability of the dem democratic form of government that defines the country only highlights the degree to which America remains recognizable only insofar as it strives to maintain allegiance to its founding principles. The spirit-driven idealism intrinsic to American identity finds exemplary expression in writers such as Whitman and Emerson. It's not for nothing that our seminal American philosophy is called not any variety of empiricism or pragmatism or logical positivism or rationalism or utilitarianism, but American transcendentalism. Seven, immanentism, practical, common, and corporeal sense. Well and good, you might say, but what of that famous Yankee ingenuity, the prominent practicality so central to American character, past and present? Silicon Valley didn't come from Waldo, but more from the likes of Ben. While America may have been founded upon ideals, it's always been grounded in practical initiative and ever-evolving material know-how, 
a willful determination to do whatever it takes to meet the practical challenge of the moment. True, but this complements rather than contradicts the idealistic pole of the American mentality. Emerson and Whitman were never for a moment daunted in the face of apparent contradiction, a nature that includes and reconciles polar opposites is in fact intrinsic to that expansive limitability characteristic of the American spirit. So it is too that for Whitman and his poetic heirs, spirituality never excludes corporeality. So Whitman celebrates my respiration and inspiration, the beating of my heart, the passing of blood and air through my lungs, the sniff of green leaves and dry leaves, of the shore and dark colored sea rocks, and of hay in the barn, the sound of the belched words of my voice loosed to the eddies of the wind, a few light kisses, a few embraces, a reaching around of arms. So it is too that Williams famously asserted no ideas, but in things, and wrote a book called The Embodiment of Knowledge. So it is that the universal reach of American idealism is balanced by an accent on the local, the concrete, the material particular. Williams is quintessentially American epic, Patterson, after Patterson, New Jersey, unfolds a universe centered in no paradise lost or found, but a very real, archetypally ordinary working class locale. Eight, democracy, the commons. This accent on the ordinary naturally leads into another great Whitmanian theme, the notion of democracy itself as a political one, to be sure, but an ethical, aesthetical one as well. Whitman's prose work, Democratic Vistas, celebrates the dignity of what is common, the extraordinariness of the ordinary. No royal family, aristocracy, or hierarchy, but a leveling of sensibility in politics and art as epitomized by that most evocative and fundamental of Whitmanian metaphors, the one that gives his book its name, Leaves of Grass. Nine, and last, pluralism or diversity. Lastly, if this emphasis on the common seems to contradict the accent on the singular individual, well, that's one more contradiction absolutely necessary to the formulation of a comprehensive doctrine of soul, Emerson. For an actual fact, it's no real contradiction at all, but rather a manifestation of e pluribus unum, out of many, one, the original, if unofficial, motto of these United States, which was later replaced by In God We Trust. And true diversity or pluralism depends upon authentic individuality involves many unique individual selves recognizing themselves as part of a larger unity or community. So then, I've now listed nine interrelated aspects of the American mythos. Taken as an integral whole, this mythos seems as if it should make for a wonderful world. And for many persons, myself among them, it has. Yet there have always been those who, from the first, were excluded, and violently so, from the country's mythological promise. Given all the horror perpetrated here in the past as well as the present, an urgent question need be asked. What on earth went and continues to go so terribly wrong? One could approach that question from many angles. Here now, let me pursue a perspective prompted by the circumstance of this conference and premised on another question. What might this exploration of the American mythos 
which I recognize, by the way, is partial, is centered on Whitman and Emerson, and there's many other features, uh, obviously, that I couldn't deal with, including the substance of the black heritage and its writers, and who have been part of this as, as well. Du Bois and Douglas, you'll find some of the most eloquent spokespersons of these points of view amongst all races, colors, kinds, and flavors of people. Um, you'll notice when Emerson referenced Americans in that quote, he said, the Americans of all nations. Think about that. Um, what, so the other question, what might this exploration of the American mythos have to do with two Europeans, Carl Jung and John Gibser, and vice versa? I've already alluded to Gebser in connection with the historical rupture implicit in the idea of a new world. And I hope to say a few more words about him at the end, especially since this is a Gebser conference. But um, initially, though, it's Carl Jung and the tradition of depth psychology that I'd like to invoke as a means of beginning to understand why, despite the magnificence of so many of the country's founding ideals, so much seems to have gone awry. First, a historical observation. In sketching the American mythos, I've relied in part on Emerson. It should, however, be remarked that while revered in certain circles, the sage of Concord has hardly won the day, and it's by no means the case that his initiatives have been integrated into the institutions that set the cultural and intellectual tone of the country. Despite the revolutionary power of his divinity school address delivered 180 years ago, the church survives as the chief spiritual institution in the land, and blithely ignoring Emerson's ringing admonitions, still preaches the exclusive divinity of Jesus in a matter inimical to the dignity and sovereignty of the soul. Similarly, academe has hardly embraced the ideal so eloquently articulated in Emerson's 1838 American Scholar Address. Indeed, quite the contrary is the case, and it would be hard to imagine any philosophy more anathema to the intellectual attitude generally prevailing in American academic circles today than transcendentalism. Why might this be? Why has American culture itself been so loath to heed the inspirations of its luminaries? Because the members of the audience to whom Emerson addressed himself then and now were and are less wise than he? That may be, but I think there's more to it than that. And that more may have a great deal to do with why today, more than ever, America needs C.G. Jung and depth psychology. It's worth noting from the outset that the basic tenets of the depth psychological tradition are commensurate with certain of those I've listed as aspects of the American mythos. The sovereign privilege of the individual self is foundational to Jung as it is to American political and literary tradition. Jungian psychology orbits around the sole spiritual idea of the self and the individuation process that aims at its realization. Individuation, moreover, pursued not by obeisance to any creed or code of conduct, but by an irreducibly creative process of self-discovery, engaging the individual's own immediate experience of dreams and synchronicities manifesting in the events of daily life. Construing the significance of such psychical and material events demands imaginative and symbolic modes of interpretation so that psychology is built upon, and this phrase is Jung's, although James Hillman amplified it, the poetic basis of mind, which is the title of the course I teach at Pacifica. If, however, depth psychology may furnish perspectives that might materially aid the country in its quest for a recognizable, respectable identity, it will be because, even while it shares fundamental features of the American mythos, 
Depth psychology's own mythos includes elements deeply foreign to America's original spiritual character. The fact and force of such critical difference shouldn't, after all, come as much as a surprise, at least in the context of this talk and the figures I have admittedly selectively highlighted, for neither Emerson nor Whitman qualify as psychological writers. Let me elaborate on that. The self Whitman so magnificently celebrates in his Song of Myself is in fact largely defined by the exclusion of any specifically psychological dimension. The self is not in the least personal. It exhibits little, if any, interiority. Contrast Whitman, for instance, with Wordsworth or Rilke. It doesn't negotiate knotty complexes that complicate attainment of wholeness but is rather constituted in its grandeur by an a priori transcendence of the oppositional tensions intrinsic to such. Whitman, in fact, writes from the place of what is called in English language translation of Vedantic philosophy, witness consciousness, a mode of awareness detached from the individual ego and the complexes that constitute it and indeed mediating between the ego or psyche and the purely transcendental original self or Atman. And any of you know, who know Whitman know how appropriate the phase witness consciousness is to his poetry. He's always observing from a detached place, um, which is not disincarnate, but his consciousness is in that witnessing modality. Emerson's case is similar, but not the same. Emerson, too, writes from a mode of consciousness transcendent to the problematic complexes and tensions that comprise the psychological life of most mortal human beings. As he himself acknowledges, he writes as a vessel of not so much witness consciousness as the original fount of the spiritual self or Atman, what East-West and pioneer Paul Brunton called the over-self, and before him, Emerson, the Oversoul. Here's Emerson from his famous essay by that name. The supreme critic on the heirs of the past and the present, and the only prophet of that which must be, is that great nature in which we rest as the earth lies in the soft arms of the atmosphere. That unity, that Oversoul, within which every man's particular being is contained and made one with all other, that common heart of which all sincere conversation is the worship, to which all right action is submission, that overpowering reality which constrains everyone to pass for what he is and to speak from his character and not from his tongue, and which evermore tends to pass into our thought and hand, and become wisdom, and virtue, and power, and beauty. This is bracing stuff. And notice that while the accent on the transcendent oversoul may appear to be somewhat inconsistent with the emphasis on the concrete self, one might even say ego, prominent in the essay Self-Reliance, the allusion to character in the citation assists us to see that the contrary is actually the case. The self celebrated in self-reliance isn't the narcissistic ego, but the individual responsive to the higher offices of the oversoul. It's this oversoul. It is the oversoul embodied in the personality, which ideally acts as a vessel of that transcendental source of wisdom, virtue, power, and beauty. Words which I would uh, wish uh, had some application to our current um, governance. Such transcendentalist notions may sound literally out of this world, but that's only the case when this world and the world view that informs and shapes it has been faithfully degraded. For truth, beauty, and goodness aren't only high ideals. 
They're also the invisible ground of the most basic elements of our humanity. Our sense that there's a real difference between truth and lie, the conscience and principle in life and law are realities rather than disposable shibboleths that love, beauty, and grace in action can be recognized and honored above and beyond the ugly words and deeds that breed hatred and strife. According to both Emerson and Whitman, we all have that original, that unitary self or oversoul, the fount of our authentic spiritual humanity within ourselves as our birthright. Why then does it seem that we have such inordinate difficulty living up to the ideals inherent in our nature? A full answer to that question is far beyond the scope of what I can tackle here, but depth psychology can begin to offer some handle on this vexed matter and can do so precisely because of those features central to depth psychological tradition that do not appear as elements of the American mythos. Emerson and Whitman, spiritualists as they are, write from a position of strength or what William James and another American called healthy-mindedness. They begin by bracketing, by setting aside sickness and debility. High-mindedly, they affirm the illimitable prerogatives of the human spirit, but they don't, and this is especially true of, of Emerson, even more than Whitman, who, as you know, is a nurse in the uh, Civil War. They don't give, have that much patience for suffering, for the chronic afflictions of the human soul, or the vulnerabilities of those habitually prey to the complex foibles of mortal life. Depth psychology assumes the contrary point of departure. The tradition with Freud begins not with health, but with illness, with psychopathology. Correlatively, depth psychology, unlike our transcendentalists, involves itself integrally, intimately, and constantly with partiality, weakness, vulnerability, and limitation, with all the, air, all the ills that flesh is heir to. Such debility is not lodged in the transcendent spirit of the human being, but in the psyche, the embodied soul. And it is critically the soul that in, that, in contrast to the elevation and exaltation of consciousness characteristic of Emerson and Whitman, possesses a darker side, possesses unconscious depths. In fact, the advent of psychology can be virtually equated with the discovery of the unconscious, that subterranean dimension of being that hides impulses, desires, and forces that often subvert conscious intent. Most crucially, depth psychology, building on the discovery of the unconscious, teaches that every light casts a shadow that every spiritual ideal formulated by the conscious personality will perforce constellate a dark double in the unconscious recesses of the soul, one that, if it's not confronted and engaged, can readily pervert our goals and turn well-intentioned idealistic ambition into psychological and social disaster. This most basic depth psychological precept implies that each and every one of the positive features of the American mythos must have a flip side, must be accompanied in the collective psyche by a dark shadow. Let's then review those features and see if we can't identify, bring to light, some of the counterforces that lurk in the shadows of the American mythos. One, the primacy of the individual self. On a psychological level, the shadow here is unbridled narcissism. On a socio-political level, it's a notion of individual freedom and self-centered prerogative that doesn't only devalue community, but betrays the social contract that underlies the very foundation of civil society. 
Think of Amon Bundy and his cronies. Think of the zealots at the NRA for whom the gun is a sacrosanct extension of the individual inalienable rights to arm himself as he sees fit, no matter if this results in an unthinkable slaughter of innocence as it does again and again and again. More generally, the entitlement of the self when that self is not understood in its universal as well as its particular dimension, can indeed justify the repression or erasure of the other, a tendency evident in this nation's original sins, slavery, the decimation of the indigenous peoples, and the ongoing legacy of the violent racism that continues to poison the well of American polity. Two. The new world, originality. Here the obvious shadow is what Arthur Vers Lewis calls American immediatism. The belief that all spiritual value is available here now without undue effort, without discipline or training in any tradition, without terro terroir. <laughs> I can't say this. That, that, that word, that great word. It is, too, a mindless ignorance of history and heritage, not excluding our own. Without a meaningful relation to the past, time loses all substance, and we're doomed to repeat our worst mistakes. Three, nature. The shadow here is closely related to the above. The flip side of the American glorification of nature and what is natural is rawness, coarseness, and a lack of the civilizing and elevating effects of culture. At its worst, this approach is a barbarian-like savagery. Think of the most lawless aspects of the Wild West and the continuing prevalence of gun violence today. Not to mention, ever and again, the brutality exhibited in slavery and the murderous genocide of native populations. Four, illimitability. The shadow side of this facet of the American mythos is written all over the face of the collective psyche. America does not like to admit the existence of limits. Our economics is premised on the possibility of endless growth and expansion, our medical philosophy on the possibility of eliminating sickness and denying death. Not far from where I live, you'll find the Buck Institute for Research on Aging dedicated to extending life. This is in Rich Marin. Um, and, there, and that's a kind of euphemism for that let's conquer death. Yep. America's illimitable optimism and can-do attitude easily leads as well to American triumphalism and delusions of grandeur. We are, have been, or aspire to be the world superpower, the first to put man's dirty footprint on the sacred face of the moon, etc., etc., in the mold of an unrestrained and unrestrainable adolescent, we pretend most always to be the biggest and the best, a narcissistic president who has no notion whatsoever of the rightful limits of his own power is one fit symptom of this terrible shadow. Five, creativity and poetic nature. Two quite distinct shadow aspects, both crucial, come to mind here. First, celebrity culture, with its emphasis on star power and glam glow, rather than true character. Second, techne, or technology, in place of poesis or art. Illimitable creativity becomes Frankensteinian, man the maker as God, artificial intelligence, transhumanism, etc. Frankenstein play tonight. The theme is topical. Six, idealism and spiritualism. The shadow side here, derivative of an endemic lack of psychological consciousness and critical self-reflection, reveals its ugly face in a myriad of ways. There's often naught but lip service to high ideals, whereas in reality a brutal hypocrisy reigns, 
as in the paradigmatic instance of the American espousal of an ideal of equality and the enslavement of Africans and disenfranchisement of women and other populations. Indeed, in America, it often seems that high ideals act as a convenient cover for their own betrayal. On another religious front, idealism and spiritualism blend in toxic combination in various species of fundamentalism and apocalyptic millennialism, which draw upon the name of God and Jesus Christ to authorize unjust, inhuman, and, I might say, deeply unchristian acts. Seven, immanentism, practical, common, and corporeal sense. The country's laudable pragmatism can readily give rise to rampant materialism. Nothing counts, ultimately, but the bottom line. Money, power, sensual satisfaction, pornography is right here. The will to unbridled power unconstrained by true conscience. My son tells me, if I have this right, that Apple has more liquid assets or more cash value than the US government or something along those lines. Will Amazon soon rule the world? Eight, democracy. Whitman himself used the term en masse, but any positive construction of the term can readily flip into a negative mob mentality, a mindless championing of homogeneity, the rule of which is to reduce the image of the human being to the lowest common denominator, the perversion of the leaves of grass. America's endemic anti-intellectualism plays a role here, which in its extreme amounts to a self-justifying glorification of ignorance. And both Whitman and Tocqueville were very eloquent upon the dangers of, the, of democracy the rule of the people. Nine, and last, diversity. This value is all the rage today, but how clearly is its dark shadow seen? Diversity, when not premised upon and combined with a respect for universal values that lend a complementary unity and coherence to society, devolves into mere multiplicity shadow values and divisive fragmentation. Rather than e pluribus unum, the many in the one, we have simply the many. In its more extreme ideologically driven shadow forms, the banner of diversity ultimately undercuts individuality as markers of race, class, ethnicity, gender, religious denomination, and the like, group classifications, displace individuality and independent selfhood as the center of psychological, social, and political interest. So in seeking to gain an overview of the American mythos and its attendant shadows, I've spoken in very broad terms. Even so, what I've said so far may help make clear how urgently America needs the soul-centered discipline of depth psychology to complement, balance, and lend critical self-reflective ballast to its idealistic and spirit-driven initiatives. I don't mean that psychological understanding should replace the latter, but rather that it may ideally help renovate and redeem them fuel critical and psychologically self-reflective modes of understanding that may loosen the grip of those shadows that seem to have achieved a kind of chokehold on the country's destiny. Such an effort would entail not so much the kind of overview or synoptic vision I've sketched here, but archetypally and psychologically informed reflection on a wide range of fundamental issues and we've touched upon a number of them in uh, these, uh, this conference. The rightful goals and methods of education, technology and society, et cetera, et cetera. As well as specific hot button issues such as gun control, abortion, mass vaccination, gender definition, et cetera. The list of topics in need of serious soul spiritual reflection and analysis is virtually coextensive with society itself. Such a topical treatment of society's ills and opportunities 
would in fact be very much in the Emersonian tradition. What are Emerson's essays on topics, topics from topos, uh, such as love and friendship, art, intellect, politics, character, manners, etc., but his effort to contribute a soul spiritual understanding of the essential lineaments of the human being, not in some otherworldly state of bliss or nirvana, but in the whole circuit of her concrete existence or being in the world. Still, as I've suggested, Emerson's perspective and Whitman's too is more spiritual than psychological. Their vision flows from the oversoul or witness consciousness into the embodied soul, the mortal psyche. But their insights into the limitations and complexes constitutive of the latter are restricted by their transcendental point of departure, their gesture of bracketing or setting aside for the sake of cosmic and spiritual perspective, those very limitations. What might be called for then if seminal spiritual initiatives of Emerson and Whitman are to gain new relevance and force, if an imaginatively valid vision of the new world is to be wrested from the shadow of tragedy that occludes it today, is thus an integral synthesis or synergy of new and old world traditions of, we might say, American transcendentalism and European-born deaf psychology, a new world indeed, but here, now, half-naked. Thank you. So we don't have any time. Or no questions time. or anything. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that, folks. Yeah, thank you.